This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. I'm Lou Lanzarotti. I was at Alcatel Bell, uh, AT&T Bell Labs for all of my career. Spent 37 years there. And I've been retired from there. And I'm at the New Jersey Institute of Technology part-time. I've done space physics over the years. Uh, I've done engineering and a lot of spacecraft stuff with communication spacecraft and undersea cables. Uh, I've been on NASA spacecraft as principal investigator and co-investigator on a number of those as well. I had that fortunate opportunity being at Bell Labs to do that. Currently, I'm, the, uh, I'm a principal investigator with instruments on the NASA Van Allen uh, Belt Probe mission, the two, two spacecraft, and I'll mention those at the end of this. It's my last mission. I said that several years ago, but this is my last mission. <laughs> I'm also the chairman of the board of the American Institute of Physics, which is the uh, umbrella organization for 10 physical science societies in the United States, which publishes also uh, uh, journals in applied physics and engineering related fields. So this is Charlie Fest at Space and Astrophysical Plasmas 2. And back when I was in uh, undergraduate or just before I was an undergraduate, when Charlie was an undergraduate, with this was the uh, view of the Earth's uh, space environment. We knew that there were cosmic rays out there uh, because they had been discovered in 2012 by Hess, as uh, Ferd Corniti pointed out. But this was the view. This was the Earth's magnetic field in a physics textbook by Shortley and Williams, which was used in a lot of universities around the United States in 1956. Well, the situation has really changed a lot since then. And this is the very complex uh, space plasma environment that we live in uh, today, where we have the uh, very active sun, uh, magnetic fields and confined, uh, confined sun, solar active region, solar photosphere, solar corona. We still don't understand why the solar corona is heated, of course. You have a very interesting situation here where you have a cold surface in a hot atmosphere. Uh, there is all kinds of activity that's blown off from the sun, which, is, which interacts with that mag, what did I do here? Which interacts with that magnetic field that we saw in 56 there uh, making the Earth's uh, there's very dynamic space plasma environment where the Van Allen, where the Van Allen belts here are deep inside the Earth's magnetosphere. This distance out here is about 10 Earth radii to this collisionous shock wave here that uh, Ferd Coroniti talked about in terms of Charlie's contributions uh, to the field. Well, Charlie's, uh, Charlie started working in Earth's, uh, Earth's space environment and uh, did a lot of really very good work. Uh, which has continued on to this diagram that you see here. Uh, deep inside the magnetosphere uh, is, the, is, is some very complex plasma regions, and we know this dynamic uh, region here, but we don't have, uh, obviously, very good measurements here to understand all the physics yet, and I'll come to that as we go on in terms of where we are in the future. But let's talk first for, we, we saw about particle motion in a magnetic field. There's not going to be very much physics here. But here's the Earth with the dipole magnetic field and the fundamentals, and the fundamentals that Charlie began interacting with in about 1956, 1954, 1964, 1965, 1966, and about the time I got involved at Bell Labs with communication satellites was that you have ions and electrons that swirl around the magnetic field, oscillate around the magnetic field, and they bounce back and forth around the magnetic field. And because of the gradient of the magnetic field going away from the surface of the Earth, there is a drift of particles around the Earth. The drift of protons in one direction, the drift of electrons in another direction, at the same time that they're spiraling and bouncing. That's really the fundamental physics here. It's a fundamental physics that was developed in the very early days of uh, plasma physics and fusion physics, the motion of a charged particle in a magnetic field. Well, that's what we knew about after the discovery of the Van Allen radiation belts and for a few years afterwards. The other thing that we knew that existed in space at that time were waves called Whistler waves. 
And these Whistler waves were generated by lightning. When you have lightning on the surface of the Earth, here's a light, and this is, what I've plotted here is time in second, what's plotted here, not me, this is some data from, from the Stanford group, uh, data in uh, time in seconds, and here is the frequency of radio emissions, 10 kilohertz, zero kilohertz. When you have a lightning signal, you hear that signal on your radio as static, but you also have other, it covers a lot, wide range of frequencies here, and a little bit later, there's a whistling kind of signal that appears if you have the right kind of sensor at, the, at one end of the magnetic field line or another. And this lightning whistling sector is, is this, this whistling signal is, a, is evidence of the lightning going into the Earth's magnetic field and also bouncing back and forth. Now, that wave can interact with those particles. And here's what happens here. This is the electron spiraling around the magnetic field, which is this line here, and here's a, here's a wave field, uh, which has an opposite polarity. This wave can interact with the electrons or with the ions, depending upon the frequency. The frequencies we're talking about here in this kilohertz kind of time range for electrons, they're of the order of a second or so for ions, and the drift period around the Earth is of the order of 10 minutes three to 10 minutes or so. So those are the kind of periods that we're talking about here. So this wave can interact with the electrons, and when that happens, the, the electrons can change their energy, they can change their direction of travel, and they can bang into the Earth's atmosphere. When they bang into the Earth's atmosphere, they can make light emission, which is evident, which is the aurora, for example, which is the aurora. So. So given the waves that you had, this was all that was known about the waves at that time. This was all that was known about the particles. So if you got these two things, what happens? Well, we, I was involved with the first communication satellite, test communication satellite in 65, 66, 67. And we were measuring particles for the first time at geosynchronous altitude, which is the altitude where communication satellites fly. We had to know what the fluxes of those particles were so we could design the instruments properly and the communication equipment properly in order to be able to survive. So Charlie was very active as a researcher and he had a very influential paper here with Harry Pecek where he put the limits on stably trapped particle fluxes that could be in here based upon these Whistler signals and what was known at the time. And this was really very fundamental in terms of the engineering kind of data that we needed at Bell Laboratories and other institutions involved with communications and all were interested as well. Well, in addition to all this, in addition to all this kind of science, Charlie was also active in space plasma physics policy. For example, there was a very important study of space plasma physics. It was the case as in the Soviet Union, in fact, at the time, which I only learned later, and I learned partially from reading your book, Rawl, all of us who are experimenters just love to throw things in the space and make new measurements. But the amount of theory was very limited. The amount of theorists in the United States was very limited. Charlie was one of the few of those working in space plasmas. And NASA was concerned about that. And, and so was the community and including me, who was an experimentalist and an engineer, we're concerned there wasn't enough theory. So, we put, so there was a study committee put together by National Research Council, chaired by Sterling Colgate, uh, to, un, to really understand uh, space plasma uh, theory and where it was. And Charlie was a very important member of this study committee chaired by Colgate. You see all these names, Firth, uh, uh, David Pines, Rosenbluth, and Rudderman, very well-known, very well-respected uh, laboratory plasma physicists at that time. I've got two minutes and I'm not quite there. Uh, and Gene Parker uh, was a, as, as a solar astrophysicist. And Charlie was also chair of one of the panels for solar magnet for magnetohydrodynamics. There were two other panels, one chaired by myself and the other chaired by Gene Parker. They all ended up in a three-volume series edited by Charlie, myself, and Gene Parker in 1979 called Solar System Plasma Physics. Uh, it's Charlie said it's deep in the ocean somewhere, but you can get on the Google and you can get on ABE books, and there are volumes still for sale. There are $100 a volume. <laughs> Charlie was also active internationally. This is Charlie with Hiro Nishida in 1981 at a Space Plasma Physics Conference. Uh, 
Hiro Nishida was, the, was a professor and also director of the Japanese Space Agency, uh, which launched very important spacecraft, scientific and otherwise. And here's Charlie and I in Kyoto about the same time, if I recall correctly. And I certainly look different today. <laughs> I didn't say anything about Charlie. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, life is much more complex now. There's a lot more waves in the plasma. I've got plotted here the same. Time here, frequency here, and you see all these other waves that really exist in the space plasmas that affect all the charged particles that are out there. This ended up in another, I've got 30 seconds, but I'm going to take two more minutes. This ended up in a book, uh, that, well, not all this ended up in a book, but this is a very interesting book. It, there's not an equation in this book. Believe it or not, there's a theorist wrote a book with not a single equation. It's a 310-page essay, and it's a really a very interesting book that was written by Charlie in 65, published in 65, Convection and Substorms, really talking about aurora, really talking about all the processes in space plasmas. So where are we today, present day? We've got this complexity of waves. These are these Whistler waves, these, all these other things that are seen in space plasmas. So we launched the Van Allen probes in August 2012 to really understand the radiation belt and all the dynamics of this environment a lot better. As I said, I, was, I am principal investigator on, on this mission. There are four other uh, instrument teams as well. And these are two, two probes in the interplanetary, in the, in the magnetosphere to try to understand. But this is a very complex environment. And you're going to hear in the next talk about two probes aren't enough. And indeed, um, this, this Van Allen probes has found some really interesting things. They've found that at times there are really three trap radiation belts, which go away after a while. Here's a third belt. It's a shock wave from the sun hitting the Earth's magnetosphere. Here's time here. These are different energy channels in the, in, from measured by one of the instruments. And you can see an enhancement here, one radiation belt, two radiation belts, and then the inner radiation belt trapped here. This is a distance from the surface of the Earth in each of these panels. So we're to the future, to the future. In Charlie's words, to the future, and I think some of them are still quite applicable because I, I did a scouring of his volume. The conceptual content of modern plasma physics is still too attenuated to deal with the complexity of plasma behavior except by the most laborious and brute force means. And that's even with computers today. And I think you got a sense of that from the talks earlier this morning uh, and maybe a comment that I might have made. Anyone who doubts this, anyone who doubts this, please note the similarity, similar histories of fusion and space plasma physics. That's in Charlie's space physics book. Numeric, and numerical simulations and modeling are not yet really helping. They still cannot deal with the small space and time scales that seem increasingly to be central to our observational experience. As I said, we have two spacecraft trying to measure this entire environment. There were five spacecraft in the Themis, mi in the Themis mission, which you're going to hear about in our next talk from, from uh, Vicellus Angelopoulos. Five, five spacecraft in this environment. Now we're putting the five spacecraft data together with the two spacecraft data. We have seven. Seven in this huge environment. It's not enough to give probes of whatever thing we need to know, so we're lacking in data. And yet, for all the limitations in observing spatial and temporal processes and in theory and modeling, these are limitations that Charlie pointed out. The mag and he, he points out, and that's still the case, the Earth's magnetosphere, close by, often ignored, important for technologies and communications and navigation. The magnetosphere is the astrophysical plasma about which we will always know the most. That's really very important as we speculate on pulsars, on we speculate on the sun, and even as we speculate and think about the planetary magnetospheres, which we're going to hear about in our third talk from Margie Kivelson. So with that, best wishes, Charlie, and I will turn the podium over to Vaiselis. Thank you very much, Lou, for the nice introduction. And uh, what a pleasure to be in this uh, forum in the company of uh, such, uh, uh, such a great audience, such good uh, friends of Charlie. 
that I look forward to meet uh, in the next uh, few days. So, um, <clears throat> can you hear me now? I will speak louder. Okay, good. I'll come closer to the mic. I have to make sure I can see my presentation here. Oh, great. So um, I'm going to discuss the next 10 years in space physics, how I view it, based on uh, um, suggestions we got from Charlie on what to talk about. I chose this topic um, dear to my heart because uh, we constantly look um, how to advance um, our understanding and uh, what the next methods um, should be. And of course, that's what we want to implant our, ourselves. So space uh, plasma physics reached its pinnacle in the public eye with the first US satellite, Explorer 1, and with the discovery of the radiation belts in 1959, so by James Van Allen, that you can see both of them here. The same uh, early fame can be argued about the US uh, space program, that Apollo 11's landing on the moon is still remembered as one of humanity's, in fact, uh, boldest achievements. The Apollo program has taught us how the Earth-Moon system arose from the early protoplanetary disk, giving Earth its tilt, its season, its climate. Fascinating discoveries regarding the cosmos followed since then. Uh, space exploration has allowed us to peer to the edges of the solar system with Voyager, the beginning of time with Hubble, clock the age of the universe with WMAP, infer the presence of hundreds of billions of planets in our own Milky Way, and affirm our ability to transform our own planet through policy by motivating, through space imaging of the ozone layer, the banning of CFCs. Yet, the public excitement about space never achieved the same height again. So according to a recent NRC report featured in, the, in this Economist article a few weeks ago, the US space program's driver was primarily the result of uh, space race, the space race during the Cold War. Today, space exploration, a much needed source of inspiration for young minds, has been in the decline. In stark contradiction, though, NASA's primary mandate is to inspire the nation in science and engineering by addressing some of our most vexing questions. Where do we come from? What is our destiny? And are we alone? But how can NASA in general, and space physics in particular, explore bold new directions and galvanize a nation to keep moving forward, even with declining resources? Well, a confluence of events makes this answer evident and shows that the dawn of, the space, of the, uh, a new age in space physics is actually imminent. Now, with the retirement of the space shuttle and the continued need for space station resupplies, a vibrant commercial space industry is uh, emerging. So the government funding uh, partially the space industry, along with the ingenuity and entrepreneurship are fueling the space tourism industry and are making space far more accessible now than ever before. In the meantime, space science is slowly coming to the realization that big, expensive missions are no longer sustainable and that a new mode of conducting space science has to emerge that is both inspirational and transformational. So let me start from the scientific need for this first. So Earth's space environment, as you've heard uh, by previous speakers already, its magnetosphere hosts uh, universal space uh, plasma processes that uh, uh, Lou uh, already discussed. The most overarching of these, in my, my, in my view, is uh, energy conversion from magnetic to particle kinetic energy and vice versa. This happens at the edge between the magnetosphere and the solar wind here, or interior to the Earth's magnetosphere. And that's very complex. The dynamic wind drives magnetospheric circulation, it uh, stores magnetic energy and then releases that energy to particle acceleration, ionospheric heating, um, and also uh, relativistic so-called killer electrons and space currents near Earth. So you can see, oh, well, recent uh, research with Themis and Artemis now shows that this environment is, is extremely complex. And as Lou uh, said earlier, um, single satellites cannot do justice to the complexity of the system. Uh, power conversion, it's sheets of electrical currents that are less than two Earth radii wide. The scale here is 40 Earth radii across. The Earth is here in the middle, and this is a magnetohydrodynamic situation, uh, simulation of, um, of the Earth system, magnetosphere, as driven by the solar wind. What you see here is bursts of flow and uh, 
um, that are coming in towards the Earth. That is the density of particles, I believe, yes, coming in towards the Earth. So these uh, bursts of energy uh, conversion are important under all solar wind conditions and, and power complex by universal plasma physics processes. So at these uh, thin layers, this conversion happens, yet, yet it affects the entire 40 Eyre scale magnetosphere. So you have a cross-scale interaction process that a single satellite cannot capture. All right, not only do, we, uh, do this process affect space weather that's important for satellites and humans in our local space environment, but also they power complex universal plasma physics processes that we can't uh, study in uh, such detail anywhere else but in, in our near Earth environment. So by using this near Earth space as a pristine uh, laboratory, then we can study these processes at Earth locally and globally in ways not available to us elsewhere. And uh, then conduct comparative studies, as you will hear more about later, uh, between solar wind driven magnetospheres such as Mercury's and Earth's, with rotationally driven magnetospheres such as Jupiter's and Saturn's. And looking further away from Earth and uh, other uh, astrophysical objects, at young stellar objects, similar processes are responsible for jets, astrophysical jets, enable an accretion. At the sun, similar processes involving reconnection and uh, wave particle interactions heat and accelerate the solar wind and are responsible for also for solar flares. At magnetars, similar flares produce gamma rays of sufficient intensity to ionize our own ionosphere from 10,000 light years away um, and uh, when, they, when they erupt. But at Earth, we can study them safely and up close. So this conversion, though, um, cannot be understood, as Lou mentioned, by just a few satellite fleets. It requires hundreds of satellites. And uh, strategically deployed, a series of regional constellations that then coordinated can form a global network. So the importance and the immensity of this task was realized by Charlie through our discussions. I was um, in, back in 93 at UCLA. Um, and uh, he was mentioning this to me uh, early on, but then he got a stare out of me, just a, a, a glare in my eyes. I hope it didn't come through very uh, too much. But uh, the idea was that uh, you would uh, engage different agencies and different nations to contribute towards a common goal by setting a fund uh, uh, by creating agreements on a set of fundamental measurements and uh, data exchange process whereby everybody would contribute and people would share their data. Uh, well. Uh, after that, uh, Charlie went to uh, uh, NASA headquarters uh, in a uh, different di discipline, and only now I realize that oceanographers have actually benefited from, from these ideas uh, of Charlie. And I wouldn't be surprised if actually these, uh, these ideas found their way in the implementation of, um, of their system, because they have the same problem as we do. They face a similar challenge. In 98, though, they implemented a hugely successful Argo program, which is a global network of more than 3,000 buoys built by more than 30 countries. Okay, their number, uh, uh, their number the number of buoys in the oceans, uh, which was one every three by three degrees, latitude and longitude, is dictated by the oceanic Rossby radius. And uh, Argo, and this is one of the buoys there. They transmit the data to, uh, through satellites, and then everybody shares the data. 30 countries, each, uh, each uh, implementing organization is another color in, this, uh, in these dots. So Argo is now the dominant source of information on the climate state of the oceans, and is critical to weather forecast models. So we have a similar problem in space. Just as studies of our atmosphere and hydrosphere require constellations of dozens of weather stations and ocean buoys, or hundreds of uh, weather stations and ocean buoys, our magnetosphere too requires uh, hundreds of microsatellites to be fully explored and understood. So the first breakthrough towards that goal has been political. NSF has underwritten the use of excess throw weight on U.S. launches by funding so-called CubeSat missions of 1 to 10 kilogram spacecraft with standardized interfaces towards uh, uh, to the primary payload adapter ring. You can see one of these adapter rings here and multiple CubeSats that are, that are kind of uh, tugged uh, on this boat and that they're released uh, after the primary is released. NASA then followed suit five years later so these low-cost missions are done now for the benefit of education, but are already trailblazing miniature instrumentation and uh, satellite technologies. 
not just academia, but NASA and industry love them too because they have a frequent uh, launch opportunity to test new technologies. More than a hundred of these uh, CubeSats have been uh, selected to take advantage of newfound capabilities on U.S. rockets, and many have launched already. By reducing the fear of failure, this model is allowing frequent launch opportunities then to dozens of groups around the country and provide the recipe for future, uh, future exploration and for even more ambitious missions. The second breakthrough has been the maneuverable version of this, S this adapter ring, which is shown here with propulsion. So the idea then, this is called the Sherpa ring, after the Sherpas in Tibet. This can guide and then release secondary payloads into their orbits, which are different from the primaries. So thanks to this Sherpa ring, several hundred CubeSats can be launched together with each primary on orbits ranging from low Earth to high Earth orbit. And each can be a constellation in itself. Progressive de deployment of such constellations on strategic locations, motivated each by its own scientific priorities, is critical. So a reconfigurable ionospheric constellation first, here at lower altitudes, uh, say on several pedals covering three to four uh, hours in uh, local time, can then uh, answer seminal questions on how the magnetospheric energy is actually dissipated to the ionosphere affecting atmospheric loss rates and ionospheric scale height, and so on. The next would be a radiation belt mission, three to five uh, hours on local time again, 10 CubeSats per pedal, three to five pedals. So this would address the critical question of the extent and the interrelationship, the self-organized, uh, self-organization of the most geoeffective energizations. And next would be a magnetospheric uh, constellation at 12 to 20 or 30 iot here, um, studying uh, the partitioning of the converted magnetic energy to kinetic of wave or wave electromagnetic energy. Of course, again, like uh, for Argo, partnership between agencies and nations can accelerate this development and this network. But in this greater plasma physics uh, observatory, specialized focused experiments can also form small size missions of their own. University CubeSats, NASA test flights, and even small fleets with relay stations can be deployed first at Earth and could trailblaze missions to other planets even. The scientific impetus from such new launch capabilities can only be surpassed by the educational benefits for the new generation of scientists and engineers, something that I can vouch for personally through our uh, student-built uh, CubeSat, uh, which we call ELFIN. You can see some pictures of it here. These are our students. By allowing the next space explorers to try, and if they fail, try again, we will not only involve our, evolve our technologies, but we will unleash the ingenuity and uh, build excitement ar around space, which is a primary mandate of NASA. So I'd like to leave with you the smiles of the students in this group, in my group, who decided to take a picture on their own following an Air Force review of our CubeSat. They take ownership of the program, and they feel very responsible for their product. They are also the most effective ambassadors, communicators of what we do in our field to the young generation. Their excitement is contagious, and this is the best omen, then, for our field's future. So these are your grandchildren, Charlie. So happy birthday. <laughs> so with that, I'd like to ask um, Margie to come. Okay, so um, it's a great pleasure to be here, and I am going to talk about extending comparative magnetospheric studies beyond the solar system. Uh, I was asked to introduce myself. I'm a converted particle theorist. Uh, I dabble in theory and data analysis. I was PI on the magnetometer for Galileo, and that was a great experience. And uh, comparative magnetospheric studies became a very central issue for me. Um, I'm emeritus, but not retired, and I've taken advantage of that by adding another job. So I'm sometimes at University of Michigan. Um, my connection with Charlie uh, uh, focuses mainly on this UCLA connection. I uh, had the pleasure of being a colleague of his, listening to his talks, collecting his numerous 
uh, papers and books, and I've learned a great deal of my physics from, from him, so I'm very grateful for that. Uh, I, too, uh, thought of the Kennel Committee's a uh, study on solar and space physics in 1980, which advocated comparative magnetospheric studies for many reasons, and particularly relevant to this talk, uh, he, he, the, they asked that we go into a comparative magnetospheres uh, study to understand better the interaction of the solar wind with solar system bodies other than the Earth, and from their comparison learn about astrophysical magnetospheres in general. The report advocates studying rapidly rotating magnetospheres, and for that, uh, Jupiter and Saturn were the main targets. Uh, unforeseen at the time was that there would be discovered a moon magnetosphere, uh, which is not in the solar wind. I don't have time to talk about that. And was uh, not mentioned in the report, as far as I could see, was the heliosphere, which is the biggest magnetosphere of all. Um, extrasolar planets at that time were purely theoretical, so you can see that the vision involved in this report. So elements of a planetary magnetosphere, you've heard about it already. We have a central star, the sun, but it could be any star that's blowing out a plasma wind. A plasma is composed of equal number of positive and negative charges, so it's electrically neutral. And collisions are infrequent, which is why all of these self-organized uh, uh, processes become very interesting. Uh, the wind flows out when it encounters a planetary magnetic field. There is an, uh, the collisionless shock you heard about, and inside that region is um, is a and inside is the region dominated by the planet's magnetic field. The wind blows around it. Um, the, the planetary magnetic field forms a barrier to the plasma, so we have a cavity in the wind. And I'm going to introduce the idea of a generic cavity, where this is the wind magnetic field. Uh, this is the magnetic field of the planet, that is, field lines that start on the planet and end on the planet. And then there are field lines that connect from the polar regions of the planet uh, and don't come back to the planet, but go into the solar or stellar wind. And I'll be using that kind of model to show you something that's kind of fun, I think. So um, the question that I'm addressing briefly is, are there magnetospheres in other systems? Now that we know that extrasolar planets exist in great number, uh, the question is, are they magnetized? And it is, uh, is it even interesting to know if an extrasolar planet is magnetized? Well, one thing that would be interesting about knowing whether an extrasolar planet is magnetized is that a magnetic field of a planet implies that there's a conducting fluid in motion somewhere within the planet. And that tells us a lot about the planet's current state, but also uh, gives us uh, some clues onto its evolution. Also linked to the question of life in and beyond the solar system is the question of whether the planet has an atmosphere. And there are many who believe that a planet, and here just uh, look at the small size of Earth relative to its magnetosphere, the atmosphere is embedded in this cavity and perhaps can be protected by this cavity from being uh, pulled off by the flow of the plasma uh, uh, that is incident on it from the, from the solar wind. Well, what about planets on our solar system? Most planets have magnetic fields, internal magnetic fields, but not all. So the ones that do are Mercury, Earth, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Uh, Venus and Mars are without uh, magnetic fields. And you'll notice that the absence 
Uh, Venus is the same size of Earth as Earth. Mars is much smaller. Mercury is much smaller. It doesn't have any relation to size, rotation rate, or distance from the sun. How about atmospheres? Well, most planets have atmospheres, but not all. And here, the ones that lack atmospheres are Mercury and Mars. Again, uh, the exceptions are hard to understand, and they don't, they're not the same as the exceptions uh, in terms of which planets have magnetic fields. Nonetheless, there is a possibility that the magnetic field helps retain an atmosphere. So how can we establish the existence of a planetary magnetic field uh, in an extrasolar planet? Well, magnetized planets, as Lou has explained, emit power at radio frequencies. And here's an example from Jupiter, where we're plotting frequency versus time, and this is 10 hours. And the uh, color bar tells you how intense the radiation is at the different frequencies. It turns out that this pattern uh, of very complex, some f at high frequencies, some at low frequencies, repeats every 10 hours. And so by looking at the, ro at the period of repetition, you can tell uh, that the planet is rotating. And because these emissions are controlled by the magnetic field, uh, you can, um, you can uh, get an idea of uh, the properties of the magnetic field, in particular, the frequencies at which some of these emissions cut off is related to the strength of the internal field. So by studying these radio frequency emissions, you learn about the, the existence of a magnetic field, the rotation period of the planet, and the value, uh, the magnitude of the surface field. Uh, why does the uh, intensity vary as the planet rotates? Well, some of these uh, emissions occur in cones, and the idea is that if the magnetic field of the planet is tilted, Earth will in, uh, intercept one of these cones only at certain rotation phases, and th that's what uh, allows you to uh, get a period, periodic variation of the intensity. Um, I see I have two minutes left, and there's, like the other speakers, I will uh, continue with my talk, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so if intensity modulated emission were to be observed from an extrasolar planet, you could infer the existence of a magnetic field, infer the rotation period, and by looking at the high frequency cutoff, get an idea of the surface field intensity. Well, Saturn doesn't work the way Jupiter works. So uh, here we have a situation where the magnetic field isn't tilted. Nonetheless, the, the emissions of radiation from Saturn are periodic at a period that is very close to the putative planetary rotation period. We don't really know what the interior rotation period is at, at Saturn because all we can see is clouds. Uh, however, there are theoretical studies that have suggested something like 10.3 hours as the internal rotation period, and the emissions that we see center around 10.7 hours period. Uh, so here we have a planet that doesn't have a tilted dipole but still has periodic radio emissions. And so I'm going to take a digression to talk about an interesting idea as to what causes that periodic variation. Um, the source of emission is not fully understood. But here's an idea that has been um, pointed out by David Southwood. And I'm giving you an example of what happens if you have a distinction between the field lines that I showed you in that schematic, uh, field lines that are closing on both ends of the planet, which I'm just drawing as straight lines, 
and a central region that's rotating. And we think of this base as being very, very highly conducting and not in motion uh, where the field lines are straight, rotating where the field lines are not straight. So we, have, we start out with an azimuthally symmetric system. And as angular momentum is transmitted to the solar wind, you'll see that the system becomes unstable and generates signals at the rotation period. So this is the computer simulation. We started, as I said, by twisting the, only the bottom of the flux tubes of, of the field lines. The field lines get twisted up and then uh, I'm going to try to hopefully show you a movie of what happens. Okay, that's there we start. We start twisting. And as the twist begins to grow, you will see that the central part becomes unstable and starts generating uh, compression of the field on the, in the outer regions. It, uh, it appears that in the transmission of angular momentum along the flux tube, it cannot tr continue to transmit to the upper boundary w in, in a stable manner. It becomes, uh, it becomes unstable. And just watch here, you'll see the compressional uh, disturbance that suddenly radiates out. Pardon me? Oh. Uh, the movie isn't playing. No. Oh dear. Uh, I I don't know what's gone wrong because it. Okay. Well, I don't know what to do about that. How this do might I, be outside my uh, okay. jurisdiction, but I can try and help you real quick if you want to keep talking about it. Okay. No. Uh, well, I can't keep talking. <laughs> show. I think we'd better. What I'm going to suggest is I'm going to go on, and finish the talk, and then during the discussion period, maybe our uh, helper here will uh, figure out how, how we can show it to you. Apologies about that. OK, I, I did test that it came up, but I didn't test that it was on the screen. OK, well, so from two solar system cases, it seems that independent of whether the field is tilted or not, there will be periodicities at close to the uh, planetary rotation period. And uh, uh, again, we, are, we hope that we will see that in extrasolar planets and uh, uh, learn that the planet has an internal field. And we'll be able to infer it, uh, something about the interior. However, the other question is whether the planet has retained an atmosphere. And there are some who say yes. Uh, we know that the solar wind re removes atmospheric planets from uh, atmospheric particles from unmagnetized planets. We know that the solar wind uh, removes particles from unmagnetized planets at a rate of 10 to the 24th to 20, 10 to the 26th per second. And we could imagine that a magnetic shield, which prevents the solar wind from accessing the upper atmosphere, would protect an atmosphere. However, there are those who say no. In particular, Bob Strangeway notes that Earth's <coughs> polar atmosphere is intensely heated by interaction with the solar wind. And that's both electron precipitation heating and electromagnetic wave energy heating. And the net outflow rates uh, become very, very high, although from a localized portion of the atmosphere, the net rates are comparable to the rates that have been reported for Venus and Mars. So it's not at all clear that one can make the assumption that a magnetic field protects an atmosphere. OK. that. Uh, well, that's something we're going to have to continue to fight, at, fight about. But we've come quite far along the path that Charlie and his colleagues staked out almost a quarter of a century ago. And it's fun to think of 
what we'll know about extrasolar planets in another 25 years, some of it more directly than up at this time. And happy birthday, Charlie, and thanks to you and Ellen for setting up this gathering, and I'm really honored to be one among your many fans. Thank you. We'll see what we can do about that movie. Oh, now I can show you the movie. Is it working? Yeah, I'm going to just show it because I think it is quite interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, so you see it's twisting up, and for the, at the beginning of the twist, you don't see much, and then it goes completely unstable. And I think that has to do with the fact that axisymmetric systems can't change angular momentum. But if you want to, so if you want to change angular momentum in an axisymmetric system, you got to break axisymmetry. I think it's kind of an interesting, and I think it may well be right. <laughs> may even be. Okay. okay. Do you want to join us, uh, Margie? I will. Sure. I'm just going to. No, no. Uh, I, I'd like to make a couple of comments, and then we'll okay. take it. The studies of the Earth space environment were driven by several things. Uh, one was just pure science. Another is a very practical fact that we need to know the environment that we live in in order to ensure that the environment doesn't harm our technologies that fly in space and are that exist on the surface of the Earth because the uh, space environment can cause problems at the surface of the Earth in terms of power grids and long telecommunication cables and such things. So what we've learned a lot about the Earth, local Earth space environment, the other driver from our learning about it, it's learning about the science, you begin to understand and be able to apply that to other systems in the solar system, as Margie talked about, and as, as uh, Vasilis talked about, and then going on to the larger scale of the universe. So, as Charlie summarized, and as I quoted him, knowing the Earth space environment is going to be, is necessary for all of these purposes, and it's the only astrophysical system that we're ever going to understand scientifically the best, and for all practical purposes of living here on Earth. So we, we had this discussion today here, and I would like to open this to questions related to science, practical applications, and, and what we've learned. And Bruno has his hand up. <laughs> what do you want to talk about? Yes, yes. Yeah. I we knew the, that you were going to ask I, that question. I worked for the boys at the Super Bowl. And uh, the two, Carly, uh, you didn't even mention uh, uh, Neptune and Uranus. Yeah. They don't fit your picture. You that you mind. made. There are two magneto tails. The magnetic field is not only inclined, but it is offset. So the magnetosphere is very different. Absolutely. That's why I avoided talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> I was interested in your comments. <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by what happens with this, these wildly asymmetric magnetic configurations. And, and not only were there very unusual conditions in terms of the magnetic field at Uranus, but the fact that it is, was tilted with the, the spin axis toward the sun, and now the next time we're likely to meet it, it will be tilted perpendicular to the sun, and what will that look like? I mean, that's really very interesting. Now, then, there is a related question, since you're interested in policies, like in future, NASA does these things. Now, Voyager is the first opportunity that human beings had to see exactly what goes on at great distance at the edge of the heliosphere and beyond. And do you know what the budget is that for the Voyager 2? You mean, uh, what the budget? I'm, I'm a, I'm a co-investigator on both Voyagers. Yeah, uh, the total Alpha budget of the... You mean, at the, the current time? How the current time. It's a few million dollars a year. To That's right, it's miserable. Yeah. It, well, I think it's mismanagement now. There are so many, many much data, you know, so much to be understood that with a budget like that, you cannot. Understand it. It's not a fusion. 
<laughs> well, there are a lot of data that could be continued to be analyzed with Voyager. That, that's indeed correct. I, I think I could comment. NASA has a, a process by which they review ongoing programs for a continuation of data analysis. And it's a few million dollars a year. But the decision that NASA now has to make is the same few million might be able to buy a few CubeSats and do something else. And so there's this constant tussle between extracting the gold from the mines that we've already looked at and hoping to find something new. And, uh, and the interesting thing is that you're not talking about hundreds of millions of dollars no. to get on that frontier. You're talking about tens of millions. It's a big difference. That Vesalis, I think, is going to do so much. Yeah. Uh, this, this, yeah. Vesalis has just gone through the senior <coughs> review with his Themis, and we are going to be doing it next with yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so we wanted to go around this, um, not very much, probably, on the other 40 uh, million for uh, all operating missions, at least for heliophysics, that's yeah. 13 of them. So that's split amongst the two missions, and the process is called senior review, and the community gives uh, ranks those missions according to productivity and um, expected results in the next two years, and NASA funds them according to, to this survey. Now, the process could be better, but there is a process of work. Yeah, there is a process of work. It, uh, it could be improved, but this process is kind of working so far. Yeah, I think I kind of support, support what uh, the budget of NASA is enormous. These are few millions. <laughs> okay. Uh, other yes. It's, uh, a lot of money to the patient office here. <laughs> <laughs> We've got some questions back here. Yeah, I, I, I was just what, what professor. Yeah, why don't you introduce yourself? Here. I'm David Spurgle. David. Yeah. And uh, this mostly, I guess, remarkable. But we're now finding lots of extrasolar planets quite close into their host stars. And I'm thinking about planets. I have to see him to hear. Sorry. Him. Thinking about <laughs> Jupiter-like planets that are orbiting at three stellar radii yeah. around the host stars. Yeah. What would be your expectation for uh, radio emission? What should we be looking for to see evidence of the interaction between these Jupiter-like planets, many of which will have their own magnetic fields, we suspect, we so suspect. their own system, um, with the magnetic field of their stars? Yeah, well, uh, th th it's of course a a very difficult question to answer because you, we don't know the properties of these stellar winds that we're that that at least I don't know about what exactly what the interaction conditions are. Nonetheless, it it's plausible that there should be periodic radio emissions that are distributed in frequency in a repeatable manner, and I would think that they would. Uh, be of, uh, that that you would be able to distinguish those patterns in with radio, you know, good good coverage of the radio spectrum. A lot of these planets will likely be tidally locked. Yeah. So that you know they will they will be tidally locked to their host star. So right. They're, they're, uh, right. That still gives them a rotation period. Uh, it, uh, once they rotate about their axis once per rotation. And that's, it, Mercury has its own magnetic field and it takes 59 days to go around its axis. So I, I don't think that's a limitation. Okay, we have a hand, Ber Her and then Raul, and then we have a couple, yeah. Uh, I have two questions. One, one is a comment on, on your uh, a deceleration of Jupiter's rotation. Yeah. Uh, is it cons consistent, first of all, with, with, with uh, uh, the uh, simulation that you have? I mean, can you get the right rate? And second, uh, uh, what about uh, the consistency with uh, the, the life of the planet? And, and, when, would, and when will the, uh, the, the uh, rotation stop? Uh, because, uh, at this rate, you I'm not quite sure I understand uh, it, the consistency of uh, this. The mo prediction of the simulation. Uh, okay. So the rate is slowing down. Well, the second is, is given this rate, how long? Uh, uh, what will the 
Uh, rotation stop in how many years? I see. Okay. Now I understand. So we're losing angular momentum. It's absolutely negligible compared with the angular momentum of the central body. Uh, the problem is that you've got to get the angular momentum first to uh, uh, retain the atmosphere in rotation. And so we, you need pretty good vertical transport in order to keep the atmosphere from slowing down. And that's, uh, that seems to ha happen at, at Jupiter. The, the atmosphere, the polar atmosphere doesn't um, seem to slow down. So. OK, the, the, the second is, is uh, the, the, the big, I think one big issue is whether to get man, man onto Mars. And I think NASA is uh, fighting with this. I wonder if we could have an update of uh, the uh, manned mission and, and uh, perhaps a statement about uh, uh, is, is that worth pursuing or, or is it really should all be done by science? by robotic uh, instrumentation. I think I'll turn, uh, <laughs> turn that one to you. Well, why don't you let the chairman of the Space Studies Board. OK, good. Uh, <laughs> which, uh, which was discussed, yeah. yeah. OK, David, you want to? Yeah. Oh, well, which what chairman? The, the, uh, the, <laughs> you want to hand it off to Charlie, right? Yeah, yeah, right. Charlie. Well, I, I'll, I'll expect peer review. Absolutely. <laughs> so um, I think that even within the NASA administration now, there's a recognition that even if we wanted to devote major resources to Mars, uh, we couldn't get there with the present technological capabilities and that it's decades away. And so it's again, if you accept Mars as a goal, which is a different question, but if you accept it as the ultimate goal for human exploration at the moment, uh, then you're again uh, engaged in one of these intergenerational projects in which the management philosophy becomes absolutely essential. And what you need to do is to convincingly lay out a roadmap of how you're going to get there, how you're going to fund it with a level of budget, uh, and how you're going to produce scientific and public interest along the way. And so you need actually to convince the people first that you want to do it, that it's worth doing, and then after that, here are the milestones along the way. The present approach that, uh, that uh, NASA has in mind uh, follows from a political declaration that was made by the president uh, what, three or four years ago, in which he said uh, we were going to go to an asteroid by 2025 with humans. The problem was we couldn't do that either. So uh, NASA's approach has been to bring the asteroid to people and bring it close to Earth and send out a long, uh, JPL could probably do this, but they will send out a, a spacecraft that will capture a small asteroid, probably the size of this table, and bring it back into not low Earth orbit, because that's a little dangerous, but someplace around the moon. And then we'll send astronauts to go study the dumb thing. And that will be the human landing on an asteroid for the time being. Uh, what what uh, NASA then argues, and there's some point to this, that if you think that the, the important thing is to develop the operational capacity to sustain long-term complex operations in space, this will certainly be one of the most complex operations that we've tried, and the engineers will learn. Trouble is, will the public be interested? <laughs> well, I think we have one side of the scientific community that's warning us about asteroids striking the Earth, and now we're going to go out and capture an asteroid. <laughs> <laughs> that's the point. Well, that's why they want to put it in. you imagine this dichotomy of we're worrying about an asteroid going to wipe out civilization or like the gun uh, meteorite, and at the same time, we're capturing one, and if we screw up, is it going to strike here? <laughs> uh, we're all hatch ups. Yeah, I wanted to make one uh, remark, a reaction to what I heard. Uh, you were showing some uh, quotations from earlier uh, Charlie's writing. Yeah. And uh, at one moment, uh, you said there is an interesting parallel between how 
magnetospheric and space science was developing and fusion plasma science uh, developing. From what I heard today, I see now they will be diverting in a different directions. Reason is very simple. I don't see how fusion commu community can move to what we could call Q tokamaks. <laughs> <Yeah>. well, <laughs> it's a very interesting point. Okay. Yes. This is a good nature, I guess. Can you speak up? Oh, yeah, good mind. Yeah. Yeah. And introduce yourself. Yeah. I'm, uh, Peter Williams from Cambridge. They uh, need to be turned on. Oh. <laughs> 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 Anything in America, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's on, but it's not working. There you go. Bye. Okay, thanks. Uh, Peter Adams from Cambridge. Um, just for information, like, like most climate scientists, I have to spend a lot of my time fending off claims by uh, climate change deniers that all climate variations on the planet are caused by solar variations. Um, and you, um, you, you stated in, in your talk, Margaret, that um, I quoted strange way of saying that the Earth's polar atmosphere is heated by interaction with the solar wind. So what I wondered is, is that heating measurable and is it variable? Is it measurable and is it variable? Yeah. We have one in front of you. Oh, you, there's one there. Well, right I have there. one here. And well, is this on? I, I, don't, I don't know if it's on, but I, I think I can talk loudly enough. Uh, it is measured. And it is variable. And the, yeah. the measurements that I am most familiar with have been made by the FAST satellite, which orbits at 4,000 kilometers above the surface and looks at upwelling uh, ions uh, and has actually characterized the, the flux of the upwelling ions. They increase immensely at times of significant solar activity. So the answer is yes to both. Uh, Lewis? The Earth's magnetic pole reverses very frequently in the history of the Earth. That's that, that reversal of the magnetic poles has been mentioned. Is it not significant in what you do? It, yes, it is. It's mentioned quite frequently in the literature on outer planets because uh, when, uh, when we find a planet whose magnetic field doesn't follow our expectations, we say maybe it's in the middle of reversing. <laughs> so it's very useful for comparative magnetospheres. It may not be relevant at all. Uh, the, the reversal, though, is, you know, characteristic time between reversals, 100,000 years, and the characteristic time for a reversal to take place is 10,000 years. So over the time scale of exploration of extrasolar planets, that has not been a relevant uh, consideration. But we do have people who are trying to use the magnetometer measurements from Pioneer, uh, Voyager, and Galileo, and now the upcoming uh, mission of Juno, which gives us a, a more than 30 years span. Uh, and uh, we, we're looking to see if we can see changes in the internal field. So far, I would say it's marginal. The, the sun's field wrote to, um, uh, flips every uh, 22 years, and so uh, we, followed, we followed that. And one can see the uh, change from d uh, dipolar to quadrupolar, a mixed kind of thing. And it's, fa it's fairly complex, but that is a, that's, a, that's an example that one can look at is what might happen uh, in the case of the Earth or in the case of Jupiter if it's uh, flipping, uh, for example. There's a, Heinz, you had a question. I think I'm looking at the time. We did start 10 minutes late, so I'm going to give us another five minutes if there's questions. Is that okay, Charlie? Yes. Heinz. But then we all have to get for our picture and eat our lunch. Oh, I forgot about the picture. All right. Go ahead. Let me just make one comment uh, on Charlie's note on Mars. I think he's dead on there. There's lots of people out there, including in Europe, that try to make you believe we can go to 
Mars in 2023 or 2026. It's a lot of nonsense. But I come back to, to, to the panel. There's one question. Uh, to study the Earth magnetosphere with lots of with lots of satellites is fascinating. Absolutely, we'll get a lot of lot of insight. My question is, can you do that and really ever understand what's going on in our magnetosphere without at real time also studying what's happening in the heliosphere? Because the majority of the of the input that we're getting on the Earth, be that up in the magnetosphere or the surface, is coming from the sun, and we know it is varying in various different ways. That is very correct. Uh, so what we need is in, uh, to know what the input is, and uh, in fact, not just any input anywhere, but right in front of the magnetosphere, uh, preferably at multiple scales. So to have, say, a few satellites out there observing what the solar wind uh, is like and what the scale sizes even on the solar wind uh, are that affect the magnetosphere is very important. But and you have so, to find that. So, yeah. for no, the no, a, so you yeah. have to, uh, well, you don't want to, to, you, to do you prediction, you want to do this, right? correlations yeah. between data after the fact. And you do want to go far, not just up front, but you want to go 20, 30, or 30 mm -hmm. away because you want to not be affected by the interaction itself. So there are upstream yeah. ions that go up there and modify the solar wind. You want to catch it before this modification. Larry, this is related to you. This is big data. And how do you handle I'm sure you're taking this in. How do you handle big data with your computers? Well, Maybe, pardon? Do you want to make a comment? Sure. Yeah, that, the fundamental thing that's going on in so many fields now is moving from solving different equations like movie you just showed to actually processing massive amounts of data. And because of the exponentials that are going on in the sensors, uh, we're getting this kind of very fine-grained time and space resolution. Um, and so it's actually like a lot of engineering. Think about the computation that Boeing does on a new jetliner. It's a, it's a coupling of massive amounts of data with simulation, which is different than just simulation. And so this ability to take uh, your, I love your idea of, of these, uh, you know, 100 CubeSats or something in all these different places. With that kind of data coming back, that then is, inter is integrated essentially by the physics of the models. And it's, but it, it's the coupling of this just exponentially massive more data than we've ever had before with higher and higher resolution models that I think are going to give us the real insights. I, I'm just amazed by how, starting in 65 with measuring electrons and protons to what I'm measuring now on Van Allen probes or what you're measuring. It, the, these instruments, our instruments are just so complex now. Uh, and, and the parameter space that we're operating in is just so complex. I mean, I can't handle it. Fortunately, there's smart students and things out there that can handle it. <laughs> Maybe la one last question if anybody has it. Otherwise, we'll go to have a picture taken and have lunch. Thank you all very much. <laughs>